From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. Various great Zen masters call it beginner's mind, the state of being free from preconceived views and willing to learn, a state they encourage us to cultivate, though it can be disconcerting. Sometimes we're thrown into that not knowing mind by a change in circumstances, like when Andy Brand, one of the most plant-savvy people I know, moved to a new job, a new garden, in a new state, and suddenly met a lot of unknown plants. I've asked Andy to inspire all of us to dare to open up to a wider plant palette too, whether by necessity or just for fun, and where to look for such inspiration. But first, this message. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. TimberPress.com. Andy Brand was longtime nursery manager at Broken Arrow Rare Plant Nursery in Connecticut until he moved to Maine and became plant curator at Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens. Since then, he's been on a steep learning curve, getting acquainted with exciting new plants in the garden's collections and in the surrounding wild landscape, too. Welcome back to the show, Andy. Uh, Thanks, Margaret. It's great to be here. I miss you. I know. It's been so long. Where are you? (laughs) Where's my pal to look at butterflies and birds and weird Uh, plants? (laughs) Still here, just a few miles more away. (laughs) So your new job and the new place, like, maybe give us sort of a short, you know, people may not have visited Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens. Give us a little bit about that, and you're the plant curator. What are you doing? Yeah, so the Botanical Gardens were located in, in Booth Bay, Maine. Mid Coast Maine, as probably may, more people may be more familiar with. Um, so, from my old stomping grounds, about five five hours up the major highway. Mm. Um, it's been in existence since 2007. Oh, so we just celebrated 10 years last year, which was very exciting. And we have a brand new visitor center that was put in this year and just opened. And uh, a really beautiful butterfly house, which is right up my alley, was yeah. started this, this year. And there are roughly 17 to 18 acres of gardens for people to come and enjoy and, and walk through, as well as trails through the main woods and along a coastal river. Um, Sounds you know, all pretty kinds good. Of things to Sound- see. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty nice. Sounds yeah. pretty good, but uh oh, you're out of your comfort zone. <laughs> I am. You know, I spent most of my life doing plant production and growing plants and trees and shrubs and perennials, and now I'm surrounded by gardens full of not just trees and shrubs and perennials, but thousands of different types of annuals that are so new to me and other plants that I've never seen before, which is just it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah. And and like I said in the introduction, you know, whether someone's moved or not, I mean, I feel like maybe it's good for us all to get this sort of cultivate this like beginner's mind, you know, like to go ahead and let new information come in and see with fresh eyes, you know what I mean? And not just same old, same old in our gardens. So, oh, definitely. No, yeah. I think it kind of reinvigorates you. And uh, at least for me, that's what I've, I've felt has happened in the past. I mean, I started here this March and just a whole new, you know, zest for for gardens and gardening. And, you know, you see different plant combinations and, you know, it just kind of draws you in to, to, you know, look closer and look at the plants. And, you know, now with the Internet and everything, then, you know, you Google this and then that takes you one step further and you I just know. keep going deeper and deeper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the rabbit hole, as I call it, right? <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. I, and I, on social media, you a lot of times you're posting pictures you've taken. We can talk about how you take the pictures and stuff a little later. But you even have a hashtag, a hashtag, so many plants to learn, which I love. You know, <laughs> isn't that the truth? Yeah. No matter whether it, we're it, beginners it or advanced, right? Oh so yeah, it doesn't matter. You yeah. know, I, you know, I consider my plant knowledge pretty good, but you know, moving up here and. It's it's a whole whole new ball game. Yes, um, and I've been seeing sort of lots of sort of new to you discoveries, like you just said, you know, annuals, and we can talk about some of those. But mm-hmm. it's not even just plants that are different. And you are a butterfly lover, and you know, is I bet I mean, like, what birds are? Is it even the same birds that you're used to? Like, what's similar birds, but you know, to see birds that I 
used to see in Connecticut only in the winter time here, you know, the year round, like dark eyed juncos are, oh, right. are everywhere throughout the summer, you know, and, you know, under your feet and, <laughs> um, you know, hermit thrushes singing, you know, all summer long, which is just one of the most beautiful bird songs you can it, imagine. It certainly is. It certainly is. And uh, you didn't have that in Connecticut. Not, you know, we yeah. would, you would periodically get them, but not, not every week. <laughs> Yeah. You know, when you come into work and that's what you hear when you get out of your car cool. is the hermit thrush singing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you probably have seagulls. <laughs> seagulls, yes. This is the first time I've worked at a place where instead of, you know, robins going over other swallows and things, you are, you know, seagulls are going over calling and um, it's really quite wonderful. Yeah. Um, so how, like what kinds of, to get oriented in your new space, or again, for those of us who are in our old space, but want to look a little more closely and get oriented, like what kinds of tools, I mean, for instance, for the wild and native stuff and the, the insects and birds, what are you using? Any apps or books? or? So any? I have, yeah, I've, I've started to use more apps, which, um, just talking to people they've introduced me to and, you know, the Internet, um, one that's great, especially for, for insects, is called Bug Guide. Um, oh, I love it. Yeah, bugguide.net, yeah. You know, you, <clears throat> you take a picture of something, you know what it is, you submit it to Bug Guide, and there are hundreds of experts on there that are always going through it, and they'll, they'll identify it for you. You know, you know, it's funny you mention that because this morning – a farmer neighbor, an organic farmer neighbor down the road from me, young couple, they texted me a picture and they said, who is this? It was a caterpillar. And it had a mm -hmm. horn, you know, kind of like a tobacco horn worm, an orange horn on one end. Mm -hmm. But the spots, the body markings were totally not right. Mm. But that kind of a chunky, fat, green thing. And I looked in my David Wagner caterpillar guidebook. I bet you've had yours out, right? You're, it's one of the best. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. not the best for this area of yeah. the U.S. Yeah. Yeah, and so I'm looking and I'm looking and it's not in there. And so what I figured is it's the it's a different age of that caterpillar. It could be, yeah, a different, in, a younger and, one or something. And yeah. so what I did is I posted it on Bug Guide and within, you know, I mean, by the time <laughs> I came back to my desk not too long later, one of the wonderful volunteers had told me it was a white-lined sphinx moth, a hummingbird sphinx, sometimes they call them. But a oh, white, white line, very nice. White-lined, yeah. and mm -hmm. my farmer neighbors said it was eating purslane. When I told them, they said it was eating purslane, Margaret, and that's what it says in the description, that it eats purslane on Bug Guide. Like, how great is that when... That's, that is neat. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned <laughs> white-lined sphinx because I have a couple right now in a, a little jar that we've found in the butterfly house here that oh. um, we had been there eating uh, an annual called Pentis. Pentis, right, right. So, oh, interesting. So, yeah. all right, so see, there we are. We're still connected, so there are, Andy. There, you know, and then I was introduced to an app called LEPS by Field Guides, Oh. L-E-P-S for Lepidoptera, LEPS. Mm -hmm. So it's all, you know, moth and butterfly identification, and it is an amazing app. You Take a picture of a moth that you see on maybe the side of your house when you're going in at night. It's under the porch light, and you go to this app, you put the picture on there, and it thinks for a minute and then gives you the identification for it. And You're kidding. Up, no, and up to now, every single one has been spot on for me as far wow. as being, Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Because <laughs> we've been using a lot of people, like when I do the moth nights in my state park, you know, that I host with expert um, guides, of course, not I'm not mm -hmm. the guide. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I haven't gotten my entomology degree, Andy, since we've been separated. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> um, but I, we've been using iNaturalist. I oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. I love that, too. And yeah. that, it knows... It knows weedy roadside weeds. It knows native plants. It knows, it seems to know insects, animals. You know, it knows a lot of different things, it seems to. And that's another sort of citizen science-y thing. So that's kind of cool, too. So mm -hmm. so you've been, you've had your guidebooks out. You're using the LEPS app. I have. I've had, yeah, I've got all my guidebooks out. And, you know, not just insects, but also, you know, plant guidebooks just to remind myself of what some of the more northern plants up here look like that, you know, in Connecticut I'd only see once in a while, if I got to the very northern parts of the state, um, you know, here, like, for instance, uh, Cornus canadensis. Oh, bunchberry, uh, huh? Bunchberry is, you know, everywhere. 
as a ground cover. We're in Connecticut. You know, it really didn't appreciate our hot summers down where I was in oh. South Central Connecticut. Huh. So. That's a beautiful plant. I, I never was good. I, I never was able to really grow it so well. I couldn't make it happy. But the places I've seen it in the wild, boy, it's just beautiful. It is. So you it's, know, it's it a dogwood those... relative. I mean, cornice, yeah? I mean, yes. Yeah. And they've, they've, ch- they've changed the, the genus That's now. what I thought. Right, right. But, but yeah, so that it was always cornice canadensis, but I can't remember what it is now. So mm-hmm. don't give me any but quizzes. It, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's one of those plants that I just always coveted in Connecticut when I'd see it. It just like, oh, you know, beautiful. And now I see it everywhere. And it, it's still... You know, when you see it, at least when I see it, it brings puts a smile on my face. You see the red berries now, yeah. and it's just so wonderful to to see that plant now yeah. everywhere. <laughs> and it has earlier in the season, it has the white dogwood like flowers. Yeah, it looks yeah. like little, yeah, typical Cornus Florida flowers, yeah. but yeah, beautiful. six inches off the ground. Yeah. So you mentioned before, you know, about your former job at Broken Arrow, and and I sort of think of you as like a cutting edge, especially woody plant and new perennials person, you know, who always knew the latest variegated or gold leaf <laughs> or uh, maroon colored leaf version of some plant. And, you know, because you guys were always either introducing or getting access to the newest things. But on your Instagram now, which is how I keep an eye on you from a distance, um, <laughs> I'm seeing all kinds of other things like crazy annuals in, in coastal Maine botanical gardens. You use annuals? We use lots of annuals Uh and, you know, not just your, you know, coleus and zinnias, things that most people are familiar with and that what I was familiar with, you know, mainly, um, you know, were those types of things, but, you know, all kinds of incredible succulents and annual grasses and these things with just amazing different colored foliage plants and, um, you know, and they just keep drawing me in so I just keep taking picture after picture and I just (laughs) you know love sharing it with people the different combinations that the gardeners here use and put together are just really incredible the colors and the textures that they they work together um very very nicely yeah there was I mean some I I don't even know how to pronounce some of them like there's one I don't know it starts with a p-t-i-l-o-t-u-s it's like Telotus or t- Telotus, yeah, Telotus. Joey. Joey, and you know, it, it, is that the amaranth relative or something? It, it's it, the flower looks a little bit like yeah. that, but it, it's this beautiful kind of um, triangular shaped terminal cluster of like feathery pink flowers. It's um, very soft. I mean, it, it, it you know draws you in. You want to touch it and look at it, and it's just wonderful, mixed with you know silver foliage plants and. Um, Everybody was going crazy for it when they walked around the visitors in the garden this year when they saw it. And I had never seen it. I didn't know it. And so where do they find things like that? So, you know, again, if we're going to widen our palette, even if we're not relocating, like where where are they looking for those types? of? It's not at the local garden center. Not, yeah, not usually local garden centers, but, you know, a lot of things you can find, you know, seed sources, you know, online that grow you know, that sell seeds of some more, not the traditional annuals, but more unusual and more obscure types of annuals. Um, We get a lot of of annuals from a really great wholesale nursery down on North Fork of Long Island, Landcraft Environmentals. Oh, yeah. Um, Bill and Dennis uh, down there, they do a fantastic job of, you know, finished products. So in like a one-gallon or a quart-sized plant that are just, they have so many different things. It's you can go through their catalog, and I have to like Google almost every genus because I don't <laughs> know what it is. And that's what I've been doing up here is just spending a lot of time trying to to put these plants into my brain and, and learn them, and um, so I can be more familiar. And then as I'm talking with visitors, you know, be more knowledgeable about the plants and yeah. how they grow and. Well, that's a good a good one. I mean, Landcraft, and, and I'll give the link in the transcript of this show, but Landcraft, and Schrader, and, and so forth, I mean, that's something, as you said, it's wholesale, so we can't order. But I feel like it's like an encyclopedia of tropical, subtropicals, annuals, whatever we want to call. You oh, know. yeah, temperennials, they call right, them Right, they call them temperennials, and, right. <laughs> you know, and sometimes a lot of these wholesale growers, if, you know, are 
a homeowner can call them and just say, you know, can you give me, I live in outside the Philadelphia area, can you give me the name of, you know, the the nurseries, the garden centers that you sell your plants yes. to? And a lot of times they will, and then you can, you know, find those garden centers that are selling some of the more obscure annuals. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, that's always a good thing to do. And like you said, also, some of them, so I frequently will read the Landcraft catalog, and again, it's accessible to anyone online. You don't have to be in the trade or have right. an account. Um and um, similarly, uh, places that grow liners, like little baby plants for uh, landscapers and uh, nurseries like, uh, I think, Hoffman Nursery, is that right? Hoffman and North Creek, I think. I think North it's Creek is, yeah, yeah, if you're looking for, you know, <clears throat> plants of native perennials yes. and, and things, they're fantastic. So some of those, Peace I... Peace Tree Farms is one. What's Peace it called? Tree. Peace Tree Peace Farms. Peace Tree, uh-huh. I think they're outside Philadelphia in yeah. the Pennsylvania area. They're great for annuals. Yeah, so, I mean, it's almost like these are like reference, virtual reference books. And, again, you can't shop from them. But then you can dot, 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 like you said, either ask your local uh, supplier, can you get this for me? Or And sometimes all it is is, oh, sure, as long as you'll buy a whole flat of it, I'll order right. it. For, I'll put it on my order and I'll mark it. You know, they'll mark it up. They're going to charge you retail, but whatever, that's fine. Or sometimes, like you said, you can find seed of the thing if it's not something that takes, you know, three years to bloom or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yes. You know, and then <clears throat> if you get to plant some of these annuals that I've been finding out um, are seeding in, you know, in the gardens on their own. Now, once you get it, you may have, you know, too much of a good thing sometimes, but... Um, the, the hot plant right now is um, a euphorbia in the garden called uh, euphorbia marginata, snow on the mountain. Oh. Is a common, and it's just incredibly three foot tall. The tops are these covered with variegated green and white foliage that mm-hmm. is just absolutely spectacular. And every visitor is just, what is that? What is that? You yeah. Know, and it, well, and you had, just stunning. you had that one not long ago on your, excuse me, on your. Um, uh, Instagram Eastern Feather Bells. Right. So that's yeah, that's a, a native plant. I, um, I couldn't believe it. I've never heard Sten, Stenanthium. Is that what it is? Stenanthium. Stenanthium graminium. Yeah. Yeah. That's Eastern Feather Bells. So it's native more to the, I believe, the southeastern part of the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this big mounding grass-like foliage that comes up maybe 15 to 20 inches tall, and then these big stalks come up with these this frothy white plumes of of flowers that are just spectacular and you get this mass planting of it and it, it's just gorgeous right how now tall, how tall is that when it's in bloom i would say in bloom the flowers could be up four feet wow because it's yeah. really distinctive wow it is it, okay. yeah and that was one that was one of those plants as we mentioned you talked about earlier that you know i had never seen before coming up here and yeah uh, it's just like pulled me right in it's like oh cool new plant <laughs> well, <laughs> there we go again put it on the list <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> as i used to say admire to acquire right <laughs> yeah, <laughs> first you right. admire then you acquire <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, but Matt- you know that's one of those plants um that just you're not it's it's frustrating because you're probably not going to find it in the trade because it's I believe I've been told it's tough from seed and it takes such a long period of time to get it to flower that most growers are not going to be bothered with it. Um, So that's one of those specialty nursery places that you're going to have to find it and be patient. Yeah. Um, Mountain mints. Now, Mm -hmm. when we chatted before this, this, this taping this show, you mentioned that you've sort of had the aha. I thought in the last year we have maybe five minutes or so more to talk, but Mountain mm-hmm. mints, I only know a couple of them. Have you been? Pycnanthemum, right? That's what I mean. The yeah, genus. pycnanthemum. Yep. Um, incredible. If you're into pollinators and honeybees and local, you know, your local uh, bumblebees and, mm-hmm. you know, pollinators, any of the mountain mints are going to be a sure thing. I mean, we've got four or five different species here at the gardens. And probably the most popular one right now with both the pollinators and visitors is Pycnanthema muticum. Yes. Um, it has this silvery cast to the foliage and it's tiny little flowers, but on a, in a morning when it's warm and we don't have visitors and no trucks, you can just hear it and it, the buzz of the right. bees is overwhelming. Right. 
Um, and other ones too, though. And that, does that have the sort of silver? Are they bracts or something? I don't know. Yeah, what they, yeah. The, yeah, silvery, A right? Bit silvery. Then, mm-hmm. But there are many other, you know, some with thin foliage, some with very hairy foliage. Pycnanthemum pilosum is one. It's, the little flowers are these. They're just covered with little purple spots if you see them up close. But um, you know, and if you crush the foliage, it has a really nice minty uh, aroma to it. Very. Mm. I mean, generally the mints, in addition to the, the, the sort of aster, daisy, composite relatives, but the mints are another one that are really o- always good with pollinators, and people will have always. noticed that in their gardens, even with a cultivated, you know, spearmint or peppermint. If it goes to flower, right. you'll see. You know, the cat mints, any of the yes. nepetas, yes. uh, cal- calaminthas, all yes. of those. You know, the flowers are tiny, but they 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 flower all summer long, which is... Yeah, really important. You know, you need to keep, you know, providing that that nectar and pollen um, yeah. to these to the various insects. And so I said at the earlier on, I, I wanted to just take a minute, you know, or two that we have left to just you take these close up photos. And over the last couple of few years, I've noticed your photos just getting better and better. And so, of course, I thought, oh, Andy finally spent all thousands of dollars on a groovy <laughs> camera, you know, but you didn't. It's nope. It's my trusty old iPhone. I can't believe that. And we'll show with the transcript. We'll show why I'm saying I can't. So what are you doing? <laughs> so yeah, I just you know see something that catches my eye, and you can. I've learned with when you go to your phone, um, and you you put your thumb on like what you want to focus on. Right. And then just with your fingers on the screen, you kind of pinch them together. You can then. A bar at the bottom shows up that you can slide, and it kind of zoom. It's a zoom bar, and it zooms okay. in on that square, and then hold your thumb on the particular area you want to focus, and then this square will flash, and then it freezes the focus. <gasps> I never because, got that far. I didn't know I that. I shake when I hold my phone, Me so too. I need <laughs> I need that, you know. Um, and then press the little circle and kaboom. Yep. And, it, you know, and then the nice thing is it doesn't look good. You take another one, you take another one. So sometimes you take, you know, five or six photos until you get one that looks good. The lighting's just right. You know, they're not going to be ones you're going to make, you know, beautiful prints out of and put on your yeah, wall. Yeah, but yeah. For, the, for Instagram or for the, you know, a computer, you know, Facebook, that type of thing, it, it works great. You making a garden at home at your new home? Uh, I am slowly. Okay, I, so you're going right to come... now. They're all kind of just healed in a bed. Actually, okay. some I hate to admit are still on my driveway. <laughs> That's okay. It happens to the best but, of us. But you're going to come and, back and tell me about that when the time comes. Oh yeah, and yeah, some yeah, are yeah. still in, some are still in <laughs> Connecticut. That need to be dug maybe yeah. next spring. <laughs> well, I'm so glad to catch up a little bit, and I hope we oh, won't I know. let it's been too fun. we won't let too long go by. But thanks for sort of encouraging us, you know, to have again that sort of beginner's minds, like be plant explorers, even if we're in the same old place, you know. Definitely. Um, good yeah. idea. And, it's fun. And, and uh, I look forward maybe to coming up and seeing you there, too, and seeing the garden. So thank you, Please Andy. do. Yeah, I hope everybody come on up and take a visit. Okay. Thanks yeah. so much. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. And I'll talk to all the rest of you soon again, I hope. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version on Stitcher or iTunes and find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or Facebook or Instagram as at awaytogarden. And happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.